Hey everybody, it's Rick Bassman here on a Saturday afternoon with a, another episode of Talking Tough. This one's special for me in a bunch of ways, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Hope you're all doing great. Um, I'm home today, not in the usual setting, because we added a fifth pit bull to our family earlier this week. And as you all know, you want to be careful about that. He's he's a beauty and a beast all rolled into one. He's doing great with my four pups. Uh, Snoopy came home yesterday from the hospital after second ACL surgery. So I'm in dog management mode here. I talk about it because you all know I love my dogs. But beyond that, I may have to jump up and run if something happens. I don't think it will, but uh, we're, we're looking good here. So the guest I have on today, as you also all know, I typically know my guests pretty well. The other, the, the guests I have on today I've known, I've been acquainted with for, if you do the math to UFC 13, that's a long time. It goes back. Um, you could almost in a funny way saying we're, we're ex-foes and nemesis because, I mean, not he and I, that would kill me for lunch, obviously, but you'll see who it is in a moment. I stood across the octagon from him in his debut fight, managing a MMA fighter that very few people remember. More WWF fans remember him by the name Ludwig Borga. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. It's kind of a funny story. Um, I don't know if my guests will look at it the same way. Well, I've already tipped you off. You know who it is. Here's a guy that, and I might be saying this wrong, and it's only meant complimentary, com in a complimentary way, kind of came from a very quiet background, almost obscurity in a way, and then goes on to become one of the greatest legends ever in the combat sports and a freaking movie star. I mean, what a combination. Who would have thought? And and a best-selling author and on and on. We'll talk about all of that as I introduce my friend and longtime acquaintance, the natural Randy Couture. Rick, how are you, buddy? Good, man. Randy, good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm out at the ranch in, in uh, Arizona, northern Arizona. <clears throat> Generally, you know, the, 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 the film industry shuts down after Thanksgiving and uh, I've got a small 25 acre ranch outside of Flagstaff in the middle of the Ponderosa pine forest here. It's absolutely stunning and beautiful. So we're spending the holidays and bringing in the new year here, uh, at the ranch. All right. So I, I am looking at your backdrop right there and that looks like something out of a movie set. That is so cool looking. And, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking about, you know, the statement you just made and it was like, so casual, You've got a small ranch, 25 acres. I mean, to most people, that would be enormous, obviously. It's so cool because the movie shut down during the holidays. That's why you're at the ranch. Did you think growing, this is a big flash forward. Did you think growing up, you would ever be sitting on a 25 acre ranch in Northern Arizona and you were sitting there because you weren't making a major motion picture at the moment? I mean, yeah, was not, that in your brain growing up? <laughs> not in a million years. Acting was never on the radar. Obviously, I've been an athlete since I was five. I started in soccer. Uh, it was my favorite sport. It's still one of my favorite sports. It's one of the only sports I can sit and actually watch on television and, and enjoy. Um, it was my first sport. Uh, my mom got me in every sport there was growing up. Sports, summer camps, tennis, roller skating. Uh, you name it, I took lessons in it. Me and my sisters, I had two younger sisters. I was the oldest and only male. And uh, we grew up in a single parent household up in up in uh, north of Seattle, about 45 miles north of Seattle, a small town called Linwood in uh, Linwood, Washington. And mom worked several jobs to, to keep us three kids in clothes and keep us out of trouble, basically. Um, so I have eventually ended up on a wrestling mat, uh, sixth grade. My best friend, Bobby Stevenson, uh, his brothers were wrestling in the junior high program. Uh, and we were going to go watch the, the guys wrestle. John and David were both on that team in, in, at Alderwood Junior High. We were at Oak Heights Elementary. We were going to watch those guys wrestle. Well, they thought it was funny. And they put Bobby and I in the tournament in the novice division. We'd never wrestled, never even been on a mat, let alone had any practice. And, and how old were you at this moment? I was 11. Okay. Uh, sixth grade. And... Uh, uh, I had my first matches. I pinned a kid with a headlock. I got my first bloody nose. I had no idea what I was doing, but you put two toddlers down there. There's a fair chance one of them's going to headlock the other one. It's a natural thing. But uh, right. I rolled into junior high that next year, and Coach K. Spear, who was the PE teacher and the wrestling coach, remembered me from that novice tournament. 
I asked him what that, what I'd pin the kid with. I didn't know what it was. And, you know, he took care of my bloody nose. And, and for some reason he remembered me walking into gym class that next year in junior high school, my first year in junior high, seventh grade. Would, would you say, and I'm sorry, I do tend to interrupt a little bit. I'm sorry, but I want, <laughs> All right. I want to help fill in the blanks a little for people if they need it. Would you say you were a tough kid growing up or were you more like a roller skating tennis player? I was, I was a quiet kid. Uh, I was shy. Uh, certainly around adults. I, I didn't, I didn't engage a lot. I was very polite. I mean, I got my, I, I got smacked if I wasn't and, and, uh, you know, but I was a pretty shy kid. Uh, unless it was around my guys, my friends. And then I kind of came out of my shell and was a little more gregarious and, and all that. I was a, a reasonable student without even trying. I, you know, I got A's and B's all through school and never really applied myself. I, I just, I, I was able to get through uh, w- without too much trouble there. But I was never in trouble. I was never in fights. I think I was in maybe two street, th- you know, kind of street fights or altercations through through junior high got into one in high school at, at a summer dance. Um, but once you kind of establish, I certainly started wrestling in seventh grade and we were getting bullied. We were getting picked on. Uh, I remember this one kid kept throwing my buddy Bobby in, into the trash can and, and at lunch and, you know, trying to stuff us in our lockers and just the typical bully crap that mm-hmm. all of us in, endured back then. Um, and I, and, you know, I started wrestling that year, was fed up with it finally. And this same kid kept harassing us. There was three of them that kept harassing us. They kind of ran together and I finally had had enough. And and one day at lunch, I double legged him on the asphalt and, and wore his ass out. And and from then on, nobody really bothered me. That's awesome. Um, you probably have no idea what was happening to him with the double leg either. I would imagine. Yeah, it was interesting, but, uh, you know, coach case beer taught me a passion and love for the sport of wrestling in seventh grade. And him and I are still friends to this day. I just watched him get inducted in the Snohomish County Hall of Fame uh, as a coach uh, a couple months ago, which was really, really cool to go up and, and support him. I got inducted into that same Hall of Fame a few years back, and he came and, and supported me in that endeavor. And, you know, my, my high school coach showed up to that too, which is the first time I'd seen my high, high school coach since I was in high school. What do your <laughs> wrestling coaches think of you going into fighting? Were they, like, fully um, of it? It's interesting. I, I think most of the wrestlers and coaches that I knew and had thought it was an interesting sport and saw the application, just like me, of, of years and years of wrestling training. The one guy that wasn't keen on it was the head coach at Oregon State, because when I started fighting, I was coaching, was the assistant coach at Oregon State University. And, uh, you know, on a whim, uh, a friend of mine threw my application in the pool uh, for the UFC back then. You know, we saw Coleman and Fry competing at a high level. Those were guys I knew from the wrestling world and had competed with and, and against both of those guys. So I was immediately enamored with this sport that they were competing in. I had a friend that knew how to get the applications. It was different back then. You put in an application to get involved. There was no amateur sport. There was no trials or, or anything like that. You literally just threw your hat in the ring. It, it was, it was. This was in uh, December of 96. And uh, they said, oh, we got enough wrestlers. We want more exotic martial artists, but we'll put them on the alternate list. So now spring of 97 rolls around. I'm getting ready to go to Puerto Rico to wrestle for the U.S. team and represent the U.S. team in the Pan Am Championships. Um, And I get the call three weeks from this trip. And and they say, hey, you're on our alternate list. We've got a heavyweight tournament in three weeks. Somebody got injured. We're having trouble filling the spot. You know, you you, you still want to fight? And I'm like, heck, yeah, I want to fight. Let's do this. So I agreed to do it without even asking my boss or, or anybody else for permission yet uh, at Oregon State. The coach, Coach Wells, was, was a great guy, and I love the guy. And, and rest in peace, Coach. Um, he, he's gone now. But uh, And him and I made up. I was a little irritated with him at that time. Uh, he said, you know, hey, it, I don't like it. I think it's bad for wrestling. I, I think it's bad for the university. Uh, but if the athletic director approves it uh, and says it's okay with him, then then you can do it. And uh, so I scheduled an appointment, went in and saw the athletic director the very next day. Dutch Bachman was his name. He was from Ohio State originally. Uh, great guy, very gregarious guy. And I explained, you know, what it was I was asking him to be allowed to do. And he thought it was the coolest thing ever. And so, of course, I got his stamp of approval. And literally three weeks later, I'm in my very first heavyweight tournament 
for the UFC and UFC 13. And that's where we come together. That's our that's our first meeting. Yeah. I remember hearing about you the first time. Uh, that's Augusta, obviously, UFC 13. Yep. And uh, I don't know if you ever heard the story of your opponent from from your opponent's camp. And uh, are you familiar with the with the journey? I think we talked about this years and years and years ago after we met. After that fight, we actually got to meet each other. And you guys were running a small gym, I think, somewhere in Costa Mesa or somewhere in California. And, and it's, it's me and Dan Dream University. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Dan Henderson were looking for jujitsu partners, trying to learn what this crazy jujitsu stuff was. Yeah. I think we ended up in your gym and we ended up having a conversation about Tony Holloma and that fight. And you guys told him not, not, you know, don't run at this guy. He's, you know, and that's exactly what he did. <laughs> Randy, the whole thing is funny. I, I want, I want to give you like a little context, like for entertainment's sake, you know, it's like you and I were talking a bit before we went live here and we talked about the, the internet, the inter, the influence the internet has had on the world. So back then the internet was still kind of like in its nascent stages that people did not, it didn't spread the way it spread these days. And Tony Tony trained, we booked the guy three months in advance for that fight. That was a long lead up for the UFC those days. Uh -huh. like, you, like you yourself said, you had three weeks. Well, during that three months, there were four different opponents. And I don't know if you heard the legend of this or not. The first guy, I don't remember who it was, got injured. Yeah. And at this point, the internet picked up the story about Tony supposedly murdering people with his bare hands in prison. And it was like, was like let out for some technicality. It made no sense. But in any case, it like it started to catch. And then Jason Farron was booked. Jason read the story and dropped out of the fight. So there were two opponents down. And now the Internet really picked up. Oh, my God, everyone's afraid of this guy. Nobody wants to fight him. And <laughs> you remember, this is going to sound almost sacrilegious for me to say this to you, but Back in those days, when very few of us, myself included, really didn't know much at all, you know, to us, the guys that like were the biggest, meanest, meanest looking guys were the toughest yeah. guys on earth. And yeah. Tony Holm was like the poster child for that. Movie. Yeah, he I mean, was. That was a big, scary looking mother, and he acted the part too, my boy. Yeah, he did. And uh, so everyone's now afraid of this guy. Mm. And uh, the McCauley brothers and I, they were involved with my gym, and if you remember, Sean mm -hmm. and McCauley in uh, Orange County, we set up a 90-day training regimen for Tony. He showed up one time for 90 oh showed up one time in 90 days. That one time he showed up, he tried to muscle a kid out of a flying armbar, and he popped his elbow. Um, and to his credit, he's like, oh, just a small scratch, no problem, I will fight. Well, Randy, this is after him making every excuse in the book why he couldn't train mm -hmm. uh, too tired i beat up 10 people in the street last night i mean it was one thing after another wow and, and we almost started to believe it although we didn't and basically we figured we're we're in trouble i mean if this guy is fighting somebody real we're probably in trouble and then that day tony being tony forgot to bring a mouthpiece so who do we borrow a mouthpiece from your manager and trainer, Rico Ciparelli, who I really? become uh, become acquainted with. And so we, I actually walked into the training room where you guys were training to borrow the mouthpiece. So I saw you for like three minutes. Oh. And I go back, I go, God, we're probably in trouble here, man. Um, you know, he's small. I mean, compared to Tony. I mean, yeah, anyway. Tony was huge. <laughs> Six, five, 300. Um, you know, Tony, yeah, don't run out of him. Of course, he ran straight at you in slow motion. What he said, though, he goes, he could never take me down. He's not strong enough. Well, Tony, he'll take you he down. Called me a smurf. He called you he a smurf. He kept calling me a smurf. He's a little smurf. You remember that, right? Um, <laughs> and we're like, you know, Tony, he'll take you down. He'll go to your belly and, you know, he'll, he'll put a choke on you. Oh, he could never choke me out. He's too little of a smurf. There's no way. I mean, it was one thing after another with this guy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, we, we all know what happens. I have to ask you this. I heard a rumor that week and years later that apparently, this could be total made up BS, but apparently your mother saw something on TV about Tony Hall. Uh, yeah. Then asked you. That was actually fight, fight night. Oh, that was okay. actually fight night. Uh, so obviously the pay per view was coming on. I had called my mom when I got it approved by Dutch Bachman to go do this show. She already knew I was going to Puerto Rico to compete in the Pan Am Championships. Literally on the way back, five days later, was my first fight on the way back from Puerto Rico. So they knew my brother in law 
and and my sister and my mom all lived in the same neighborhood up there and they all got together because they were going to get the pay-per-view and watch the fight and so my brother-in-law was right up next to the tv like this watching you know the interviews and uh -huh. tony Holm comes on the screen uh -huh. and he jumps and 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 comes back and tony of course talking like tony did yeah oh, i'm going to rip his arms off yeah. if that doesn't stop him then I will rip his legs off. And he just kept going and going. And my mom just started bawling. Here's this 300 pound guy talking about how she's good. He's going to dismantle her son. And she just started bawling. Of course it didn't go that way, but, uh, but that was a true story. Absolutely. On fight night, my brother-in-law freaked out. He's like, Oh my God, that guy's a monster. Wow. I had heard, I had heard I, that. I've been verified here to, for me, at least for the first time, I always wondered about that. You know, Tony up, we we made him hide in his room up until the fight time. So we figured our only advantage at that point was psychological. And we're going, we do your interview. He goes, should I shoot it or should I work it? I'm like, dude, just stay, stay in, stay in work mode. You know, as a pro wrestler, you know how to cut a promo for yep. sure. He was yep. Yeah. So that's what he came up with. Like rip his arm off. If that doesn't work, quote unquote, I will rip his fucking head off. I remember that. Yes. <laughs> it was, uh, it was something. And I, you know, I, I, I had never heard of him or seen him anywhere. I wasn't a pro wrestling guy. I didn't know who Ludwig Borga was. I didn't know who Tony Holloman was. We heard he was a, a boxing champion from Finland and that he'd yep. been doing some pro wrestling and that he was a huge guy. But until we stepped on the scale in the lobby at that Holiday Inn, that was the first time I'd ever laid eyes on him. There was so no video. There was no, you know, it wasn't like I got to prep for him or, or know exactly where he'd been, what he'd done, what his skill sets were, any of that. He was literally flying blind. And I imagine he wasn't very was. friendly. He probably wasn't very friendly when you met, I would imagine. No, he, he wasn't a gregarious, outgoing guy, at least not to me. I mean, we were going to get ready to compete. And the other heavyweights were there. We were all weighing in at the same time. So, you know, and I'm looking at him and Stephen Graham. I'm like, man, what the hell did I get myself he, into? Here? Yeah, Stephen was a big guy, too. Yeah. Yeah, 290. Great, you know, good football player from one of the Carolina colleges. and. Yeah. You know, training under that Green Beret and extension fighting, whatever the heck extension fighting is. But it's probably um, more effective than Hawaiian bone breaking, though. But anyway, <laughs> right? Hard to say, honestly. Uh, I mean, what's a pit fight? Everybody said, oh, hey, you know, Tank Abbott's got 300 pit fights. I'm like, what the hell is a pit fight? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, so when you, when you were facing off across from Tony, do you remember what was what were in your thoughts at that point? Absolutely. I wasn't sure if I I wasn't sure if I needed to climb that fence and get the hell out of there. He stood across the cage in his 300 pound frame and just held his arms out like that. He had a tattoo on the inside of his arm of a of a, a barcode. Yeah. And, and you know, and just this massive guy. And I'm like, what the I, huh. I had to really suck it up. And you know, I, I had a game plan. Rico was in my corner. We knew what we thought he wanted to do. And, and sure enough, he did exactly that. He came running at me in boxing stance, ready yeah. to rip my head off and just literally fed right into the double, allowed me to take him down and put him on the deck. I, I had just learned in that five days in Atlanta before we went up to Augusta, what a neon belly was. I mean, I literally had just learned it. So I scrambled around him, uh, you know, try to put knee on belly, hit him once. He rolled over, gave me his back. I went right into college wrestling mode, put the hooks in and secured a, just a, you know, a basic choke. I didn't even know how to lace in a, a proper rear naked choke at that time. I just squeezed and, and he tapped. So pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty fast. And were you, were you relieved afterwards? Were you like celebratory? The whole thing was surreal. It was surreal to me. I mean, I've been a wrestler, since, like I said, since I was 10. So you don't have all that fanfare and people reaching over the fence and trying to yard on your clothes and scream. I mean, it was a frenzy walking out of that tunnel. So that was surreal in and of itself. You go back a little bit further than that. I mean, you show up at the arena three or four hours before you're actually going to fight or walk. And so they put me and Mark Coleman and, and Roy Salger, who was fighting on that card in the first lightweight tournament which was anything under 200 pounds this is where tito comes on the scene ken shamrock guy metzger all this stuff unfolded on the same card in ufc 13. Yeah. so i'm in this locker room i got hours to kill before i even have to start thinking about warming up what i would normally do and i, I did this in wrestling matches and i did this in all my fights and a lot of some of my friends think it's kind of crazy but i would find a place to lay down 
put a towel over my eyes and literally meditate and, and go to sleep. Visualize the fight and everything I prepared to do and, and, and literally go to sleep. And uh, they're like, what is he doing? He, he's got a fight in, in three hours. He's sleeping. What the hell is wrong with this guy? No, when I'm cool. asleep on the floor in the locker room and I start hearing this screaming and, and this smashing of a locker and it wakes me up and I'm like, I'm a little confused about what's going on. And I'm looking at my watch and we're still two, two and a half hours away from even half the walk out into that arena. And it was Mark Coleman. Oh, Mark. He was oh. cornering, he was cornering Royce and they were strategizing and, you know, about, he was fighting Ensign anyway, who was no slouch. Ensign was a very good fighter. Obviously my first loss in the sport was in Japan against Ensign. So he, Mark is trying to get, uh, Royce fired up and he's bashing his head against the locker in the locker room. And I'm, I'm like, what the hell are you guys oh, doing? It's Coleman right there, man. We yeah. got two hours before we even got to start thinking about this. Um, so that was, you know, again, the whole thing was surreal to me. Uh, it was nothing like I, I didn't know what to expect, honestly. So, um, it was quite the circus in those days. And only yeah, well, there were more fights. There were more fights in the stands than there were in the cage that night. It was a completely different crowd. Yeah, it was a whole different thing. My wife at the time was up in the stands, and, and she was very nervous. She didn't know idea what we'd gotten ourselves into, and and all these guys around her are, are betting. And they're, of course, all betting against me in both those fights. I fought twice that night. And she had to run and puke in a trash can because she was so nervous that all these guys were talking around her about how the fights were going to go and I was going to get my butt whooped and and, uh, oh, and how I was going to get my butt whooped. And it really set her off. Well, yeah, you would have been either armless or headless after the fight. <laughs> yeah. Correct, right? For sure. For sure. Man, uh, auspicious beginnings, that's for sure. My gosh. Yeah. That goes bad. And then... All these years later, so you're, you know, I don't mean, don't mean to embarrass you. You're one of the most legendary names in the history of the sport. Um, I mean, it's a hell of an achievement. Guys like you, Mark Coleman, will be remembered forever. Um, I, Mark, Mark's a very dear friend of mine. You're obviously a lot more accomplished in terms of your record and, and the breadth, but you guys are the pioneers, man. And I, I can only say that in the most complimentary way imaginable. Did, did that ever, like sink into you or is it just another day at the office I, I don't think we yeah at least myself i can't speak for anybody else but i never looked at it that way I, I was just doing what i was passionate about doing stayed very focused on what was staring me in the face the competition learning what i needed to learn doing the things i believed i needed to do to be successful it was about chasing that passion that i had for combative sports that started in wrestling and transitioned into mma uh, with everything that i knew how to do everything i had from years and years of wrestling experience both in high school, college, well, Army, and then college, and you know, and, and then on the national team for years, uh, and then I'm trying to figure out how to fit that into this new sport where I was actually going to make a living and, and be a professional athlete and a professional fighter. And, and uh, so it was, it was a crazy world back then, but uh, I don't think you look at yourself that same way. You don't see yourself the way everybody else sees you. Or, or I mean, just... I think if you do, you're probably a sociopath of some sort. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's you know, we have a lot of colorful characters that we talk to and talk to. <laughs> you, you get you get all kinds, man. Put it that way. You get some yeah. that, are, that are very, very uh, enamored of their um, of their reputation, and then others who are genuinely humble and appreciative. And that's, uh, that's oh. the way. It's the way to be, if you ask me. So oh, it's in, been an amazing journey. That's for certain. So the journey, are, are you peripherally involved, directly involved with the sport these days? Well, obviously I have uh, Extreme Couture MMA um, in Vegas. That's mm -hmm. That's been around now since uh, 07. I founded that gym. I was going through a divorce in Oregon. Me, Dan, and Matt started Team Quest up in Gresham, Oregon. And I divested and left that to Matt and Dan uh, when I was going through the divorce and moved to Vegas to kind of clear the clear the decks and 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 recover, rebuild and, and start over basically. Um, and, and I got tired of training in the ultimate fighter training center where I get locked out every time they had a new, new season of the show come in. So it made a lot of sense to, to start my own facility and, and start a place where, you know, I could, I could train and flourish and create a team and all those things that we had so good in, at team quest. That was an amazing place. Um, <clears throat> so that's how team quest started in, in Vegas. Uh, obviously, 
originally it was looking at doing a gym in, in LA with boss Rutten, And we started a gym there called legends and it only lasted for about three years. Um, it's some issues with some partners and other stuff, landlords and, and doing a gym in, in the LA area, parking and all this other stuff becomes a factor. Getting it was at legends many times. And all that. Yeah, it was a, it was a big challenge. Yep. And we kind of, Boss and I both kind of saw the, what was going on with the landscape there. And I think Boss went over the hill to Thousand Oaks and started his own facility there. I divested in Legends and I, I, I went to Vegas and started Extreme Couture. Um, so, and that's just the way it worked out. And then Legends lasted a couple more years, but, but ultimately went away at some point. Um, I remember, but that, that was, was, was a cool spot. I did not know that you started Legends with Boss. Um, yeah, Jeremy Lyman was Boss and Mind's manager at that time with Battle Management, and yep. uh, he had this this concept of and and LA is a huge jujitsu town, but there were no real MMA oriented fight gyms. They were all jujitsu gyms yep. that had fighters training in them because jujitsu is such a big part of the sport. But uh, we wanted to create a, a space that was dedicated to MMA and what MMA fighters needed, and and obviously I had some experience with that up at team quest with, with Dan and, and Robert Fallis and, and, and Matt Linland. Um, so that, I think that that's how that, that came about. And then obviously Rob boss and I saw that there was some serious issues with the infrastructure and everything that was going on at legends. And it was just easier, uh, than taking up that mantle contractually and legally to just divest in it and, and go start your own thing and, and not have the partners and not have some of the other issues that were going on there. That makes perfect sense. That's a tough business, man. Hey, speaking speaking about Boss, who's also a very, very close friend. Matter of fact, the second generation of the Talking Tough podcast, I had two co-hosts on every single episode, and uh, it was better being in Boss Written. So we did probably 100 shows together, and I love Boss, and I give Boss a bad time um, still. So I'm like, dude, I go, I thought you would have been like the last, one of the last ones that would have been hanging in there and being a wild man till the day you died. And <laughs> he's not anymore. He's like such a no. good, he's such a, he's such a good straight and narrow family man. Um, yeah. but you, you and I were around it in the days and, you know, the Mark Coleman's, the Mark Kerr's, they're, it's not gossip. They're happy to talk about this stuff, as you well know. Yeah. What, what was Randy Couture's craziest persona ever? I don't think I ever had one. Uh, I think I, I did my very, very best to keep it simple, just be me. And, and I didn't create any personas. I didn't put on any airs. Uh, I wasn't, I mean, you know, I think in the army and other times I had my moments where, you know, where there was some partying going on and stuff. You were usually either commiserating or celebrating a wrestling outing with the army team or in college with, with Oklahoma state, you know, one or the other was happening. You were commiserating because you lost or the team lost or you were celebrating because you guys won and either way you were, you were out and about, but I never really got into a lot of trouble. Not as a kid, not as a soldier, certainly not in college. I, I didn't get into a lot of trouble. I wasn't, I just wasn't that guy. Um, you know, it, it's funny, Randy. And I was wondering, and I, and I kind of hinted before we started, I wanted to ask about stuff like this. Um, I can think of like every legendary name from that first, you know, into the second era, right? Where that's yeah. where you were. You know, yep. and other, other friends like Tank and Oleg and all these guys, and they were all nuts, every one of them. And I mean that affectionately. Um, yeah. You, you, yeah. you never hear anything about you. And I don't, when I say I hear a lot about you, you don't hear those stories about you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I, I was a bystander and, and saw some of, some of that stuff go on, but it wasn't, it wasn't my deal. And um, I, I never really got caught up in any of that stuff. I, I guess I just, I, wasn't that I was crazy enough just stepping up in that cage it, uh, the rest of my life was pretty sedentary and well, not sedentary but calm and and not not very, very wild honestly and here you um, are now healthy and sane as uh, <laughs> well as I, you know what and, I, and I'm proud of Mark Kerr I've reconnected with Mark because obviously he lives here in Arizona and Mark's done an amazing job of building yep. himself back up and getting himself straightened out and yes. and and I'm very very excited same with Mark Coleman you know oh, what, two. Two, years, yeah. two years clean and sober now and really taking his health seriously. And and I, I was worried we were going to lose some of these guys if the trend continued. And Boss is another one of those. I mean, there's a million crazy Boss stories. And oh boy. <laughs> everybody who's ever met Boss loves Boss. There's not yes. a more gregarious, friendly, yeah. 
fun person to be around, but yeah. at some point there's a line there. And he certainly when he'd been drinking, he was more than willing to cross that line. And, more than once that I saw. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm glad. Um, yeah. I'm so glad to see that about those three guys in particular. Oleg yeah. is doing great these days. It's nice to see him doing that. I never got to spend a lot of time with Oleg. Obviously I know who he is and, and I thought 15 seconds was, was an amazing movie or 15 yeah. minutes, was an amazing movie. And uh, he got another part I read for a, a part in that. Uh, uh, oh gosh. The, not the Terminator. It was the, uh, the monster, uh, oh, uh, pre uh, predator, predator. I read yeah. for that role that Oleg ended up getting, and oh, I, you know, All right. my Russian accent sucks, so <laughs> I was I wasn't surprised that Oleg had, got you, had you there. Good right. job, right? Uh, how Anthony was going to pull that role off was a bigger question to me than how how Oleg was going to do in that role. But uh, uh, he did a great job in that movie too. It was a fun one. He's, he's well, Oleg's a good actor. He's a good actor. Yeah. So how did you transition? Okay, again, the shy kid from Oregon. So now you're a major UFC star, and then you go into the movies. How does that happen? Well, that's a call from the UFC. They were making a film in, in the early 2000s called Cradle to the Grave with Jet Li and DMX. And, uh, and they wanted, they, they had some cage fighting, underground cage fighting scenes in this movie, and they wanted some authentic cage fighters to play characters in, in, that, in, that scene, in those scenes. So they called the UFC. The UFC called myself, Chuck Liddell, and, and Tito Ortiz. This is right in that early 01, 02 era when Chuck, Chuck, you know, Tito was the champ and had been the reigning champ in the 205-pound weight class for a while. And Chuck was the number one contender. And they were training partners and, and supposedly friends. And according to Tito, they had an agreement that they would never fight each other. Right. Chuck says that's not true. He right. wanted his shot. So all this big rub was going on uh, in the rankings and who was going to get the title shot and all that when this movie came on. They actually fought in the movie. This is a long time before they ever actually fought in real life. Who won the fight in the movie? I don't even remember. I don't think it even mattered. But no, it uh, matter. I ended up fighting. I ended up with one line in the film and fighting Jet Li in, in that scene. And that was my first time on a set. It's a lot like going to Oz and getting to pull back the curtain and see the guys pulling the levers, making all the smoke and fire uh, that, that we see on the screen. It's a really, really interesting process. And all the stuff that we did that seven days on set for 12, 14 hours every single day to get that one little five minute fight scene in, uh, of those underground fights, swinging, you know, Martin, the midget around and beating everybody up and throwing people into the bar and, I mean, it was just a, uh, it was a blast. It was really, did you, really. Did you beat up Marty Clubber in that movie? That's not well, very. I didn't specifically, <laughs> but but that was a gag in in that fight scene. He, he swings the midget around, uh -huh. all these fighters that are trying to get him, and and, and the midget smacking all the fighters and taking them all out. Oh man, it was a lot it. of fun. I gotta see that. That's fantastic. <laughs> it's a crazy that. scene, um, and. and you know, of course, I'm supposed to fight Jet Li and I'm supposed to throw a big right hand at him. And his stick in the whole movie was he kept his hand in his pocket. He didn't want to fight anybody. He would just dodge and evade anything that came at him. Well, I'm supposed to be fighting him. I throw this big right hand. He's supposed to get out of the way and he didn't get out of the way. Oh, no. Now, thankfully, oh, I, didn't, thankfully I didn't club him. Okay. I just ran him over. <laughs> right. I mean, he was supposed to move and I, I just literally landed on top of him, ran him over. Of course... Bradshaw, the director, just went nuts because <laughs> I just ran over the star of the movie. And I'm like, he's like, man, you, you didn't wind up. You did, I, didn't, I didn't see it come. I said, well, no, I'm not going to wind up. I had not figured out the difference between a real punch and a movie punch. Yes. At this state of things. Yes. And uh, that took me, with the help of Doug Crosby, and, and, and who was a great stunt coordinator and a very good friend who helped me get my SAG card. Um, you know, I learned a lot from him. He mentored me in many, many ways uh, and kind of helped me figure out and navigate the business. One of the most important things, I'll never forget this, we're on Oz because he was the coordinator for the stunts, the movie Oz, the HBO series Oz. Yep. And he's introducing me to everybody and, and all the other actors on that and all that. I just, just playing as corrections officer as a stuntman, basically. And he's like, you always judge a person's character by how they treat people they don't have to be nice to. Absolutely. And yep. that stuck with me to this day. What he said that day stuck with me and 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 set the tone for me and how I was going to treat anybody I met 
with regard to being involved in. I, I would dare say that was probably already ingrained in your character because it strikes me as that is who you are. Um, but that's nonetheless, that's a good lesson to have reinforced. Absolutely. I mean, the golden rule is the golden rule for a reason. It's that simple. Treat people how you want to be treated. It's not rocket science. It's not hard. And we we complicate the hell out of everything. Yeah. And I think the point of that is if you do it, you know, so, some people, and I certainly wouldn't name names, but some people, I think, act that way because they're trying to achieve a certain result. And maybe if you if that's not your character and you act that way long enough, maybe it does become you and you end up being a nice guy. Who knows? Well, I think there's some truth to that. I mean, absolutely. I mean, so many people struggle with depression and anxiety and so many different things. And 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 we do this all the time. Oh, how are you today? How are you feeling? You know, that's a normal greeting. And and and, you know, especially people that struggle with that. And I have you know, one of my best friends, Jay Glazer, who struggles with anxiety and depression. He's got the balls to step up and do his podcast about mental health. And his book, Unbreakable, is remarkable. And it gave me some understanding of folks because I have a sister that struggles with that. And, and I have other friends like Jay that struggle with that. And I don't have any frame of reference how to deal with them, how to how to, you know, how to even navigate any of that honestly it's not something i've i've ever really struggled with on a regular basis i've been in a couple of dark places uh through the course of my life but i've not not regularly struggled with anxiety or depression and there's a huge group of people out there that struggle with it on a oh, daily basis and it's only getting worse unfortunately and we stopped dealing you know institutionalizing and dealing with mental health issues in the 80s under reagan and i think that's a huge piece of the homelessness and and the street stuff that we see in and all over the country frankly um but uh yeah uh jay's book was amazing i learned a lot from that experience i tried to keep it simple i just tried to be myself that's how i always wrestled that's how i walked out on in that mat uh and and the same thing with fighting and i had friends that were creating these personas and, and tito certainly comes to mind because i've had this conversation with tito and tito and i've become pretty good friends same i'm friends with chuck as well i mean that's the beauty of this sport yeah we punch each other in the face this is what we do but at the end of the day i like those guys i get along with those guys Absolutely. coleman kerr you know boss those are, you know, i never fought i wrestled Kerr, coleman and kerr i never fought boss i was supposed to fight him at one point brock, brock lesnar there's camaraderie yeah lesnar i, I you know I, I went and trained lesnar for three weeks trained with him in his gym he was getting ready for carwin he needed more wrestlers yep. Uh, I actually showed him that arm triangle that he ended up catching Carwin with in, in those in those times that time we trained together. Um, <clears throat> but some guys felt the need, and and at the end of the day, you got to talk about what Dana White, as the president of the company and the corporation, is what, what he rewards. He rewards guys that act that way, that create these personas, that do publicity wow. stunts, and talk all this crazy smack and. And do all this stuff. So of course, show guys, business. Like, end of the day, yeah, Tito yeah. sees that, and you know, Dana represented Chuck and Tito back in those days as, mm -hmm. as their manager too. So he sees that, and he's one of the first that created that persona and used that to market himself and to create heat, as Dana called it, for fights, because he was going to talk trash and, and kind of try to get under your skin, make you angry, do all those things to make you think about anything but how to go out and technically beat him. Sure. That's that's a smart strategy. That's psychological warfare. That's exactly what it is. So, so you you had you had mentioned that you you yourself are, and I'm glad to hear you haven't suffered from anxiety, depression, and didn't run the crazy life that many did. But you did mention you'd ended up in a couple of dark places. Anything like really really notable? Well, I mean, the, the biggest challenge I've had is my personal life. You know, I've been divorced three times. Uh, I got married at 18. My, my girlfriend got pregnant. Um, I wasn't going to be like my deadbeat dad. So I'm like, you know, and, and she's she flat out told me right from the jump. Hey, I'm having this baby, whether you're on board or not. So I knew regardless, I had a, I had a kid coming and I wasn't going to put a kid, my kid, through the same stuff that I grew up going through this, this uh, feeling of of I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough for my own father. My own, my own dad never came around. He never paid support. He never, I, I one of the reasons I love to hunt and be in the outdoors to this day was because that was the only time we did get to bond. He would come take me out of school for four or five days and we'd go hunting, chasing deer or chasing elk. we never got anything ever, but I was in the woods with my dad. And sure. Sure. so, uh, you know, 
one of the things I miss about fighting is that that was one of the things that brought us together. I didn't talk to him for over 10 years. He's away in the army and away in college and didn't see him or talk to him for over 10 years. I moved back to Oregon, Oregon State and start coaching. He's quitting welding and doing the pipeline stuff up in Alaska, which where he went to kind of hide out and, and uh, comes back down to the lower 48. And, and we reconnect. This is right before I started fighting. And uh, so I started inviting him to come to the fights and and bringing him to some of those. And he loved them and, and he loved the fighting. And, and we built a relationship. We, we yeah. found some common ground from the days That's of him, true. you know, cracking me in the head with the butt of his rifle because I was dragging my feet or cracking sticks, making too much noise mm -hmm. uh, to, to, you know, we actually had a, a real relationship. We started communicating and getting to know each other and all of that. And then, you know, eventually he, he passed away. Um, it's got to feel good. You got to, that you were able to do that, though. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because when he passed away, you know, my two older children didn't know him at all. They hadn't spent any time with him. It was kind of strange having him come to Oregon uh, from from Southern Washington when he moved out of Alaska, he moved into Payel, Washington, in South Central Washington, which isn't that far from Corvallis. So he would come down, and and the kids didn't know him. They'd never grown up with their grandfather. They didn't know him, so it was a bit weird. I didn't know him that well. So it was this stranger in our house who, who was my, you know, supposedly my dad and, and or my father. And th th that's another story. But, uh, um, yeah, it was very weird. How but, was he with your kids? Uh, he was, again, it was strange. Um, but he's, he was always friendly. He was always a, a gregarious guy. He, he wasn't uh, a very outgoing personality. But he was, an, he was a smart guy and he was a nice guy. Um, okay, so, so they got along. But my youngest, my second marriage, and Caden, for whatever reason, now he'd moved down to the lower 48. I went through the first divorce. That was one of the first times that I was in a very, very dark place for a while. Um, a sense of failure the, and scrutinizing that I had never experienced in my life, ever. And I was already kind of operating from this position of, I'm not good enough for my own dad. Uh, now I've, I've messed this up. I'm, I'm getting a divorce. I have two children. You know, I was in a, in a very, very dark place and I don't really talk to a lot of people about that. There's, uh, you know, I don't, it just don't. It, how, how do you I come came through it? I never, you know, I, I never, I made the plan in my head, but I never went upset about executing that plan or doing anything, acting on that. But it was definitely there and it was something and a, and a place that I struggled with for a while. And eventually... The, the sun came out. I got support from some friends. I got, you know, I start, I started some counseling and I started to realize that a whole bunch of this stuff that was going into my head was fabricated in my own head. It wasn't real. I started feeling like everybody looked at me different because I was going through this divorce and, you know, I would been unfaithful to my wife and all these things that I knew in my own brain caused this situation. And it always takes two to tango. It wasn't just me, but at sure. the end of the day, you know, no one's harder on us than we are. <laughs> and and so it took me a while on some serious counseling to kind of come through all of that and understand myself better understand why i'd made the choices i'd made why I'd, why i'd ended up where i ended up in that stage of things and you think you're going to just march on and do better and not make those mistakes again <laughs> and it, you know that didn't work out that way either i, I ended up divorced two more times and you right. know so we're always learning aren't we yeah always, so always. um yeah that you know so Randy, I part of the appreciate human experience. I appreciate that says sharing that, man. Thank you. Because, you know, people watching this are going to be, you're, you're going to have people watching that, that admire you up to put you on a pedestal. There's going to be that range. And it's important. I think a lot of people out there, as you said, are suffering now. It's crazy. And it's, just, it's growing. And when they look at their heroes, they look at guys like you, and they think they – they think you're from a different planet and they meet. And I mean that in a way that I could never be like that guy is. And then when they hear from you that you've experienced maybe the same type of thing they have and that you come out of it, that's very powerful. So I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Buddy. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, when I wrote the autobiography, becoming the natural, that was in 05, I was going through the second divorce. It was again, not nearly, I had a lot more tools in the tool belt by the time I got to the second divorce. I still made some of the same mistakes, the, some of the same piss poor decisions and ended up in some ways in similar situations, but uh, I wasn't nearly 
uh, as dark as it was that very first time experiencing divorce and, and going through that. And that was, I, and I, it was cathartic to let a bunch of that out in the book. And I tried in the book to be as honest as I could be. And sometimes to my own detriment, you know, I probably exposed more. I'm sure I exposed more than my mom wanted to hear about. And, and probably my, my, my first two wives, they probably didn't want all that, uh, some of that stuff public either. But at the end of the day, just like you said, I'm a human. And we have a tendency to put these athletes on these pedestals and think that they don't make mistakes, that they don't struggle with things, and, and that, that they don't have the same issues that everybody else has just because they're good at that particular sport. And that's not realistic. Correct. It's not true. So uh, I wanted to kind of counter that by being open and honest about the mistakes I'd made, the decisions I'd made that put me in some of these situations. And ultimately, I think people will like the book. I got a ton of positive, with the exception of my mom. I got a ton of positive feedback about the book. What did your, what did your mom say? Well, you know, it, it came down to silly stuff. Well, that bike wasn't blue. It was yellow. It was like, <laughs> mom, right. this is my memory. And, and you asked my two sisters and you to describe the same story that I'm trying to describe in the book. And they're going to come out with three different versions of my version of that story, too. Again, that's human nature. Yeah. Uh, you know, it wasn't like I was trying to skew anything. This is just how I remembered the things I'd been through in my life in the book. And, and in my mind, the bike wasn't blue. It was yellow. <laughs> but that, those were trivial, stupid things. And there were more significant things that she didn't care sure. about or didn't like in the book. But uh, at the end of the day, it was my story, my perspective, the things I remembered. And it took me two years to dig through and wade through a bunch of that, so, which is a whole bunch of that's my own swamp. We all carry around this swamp Absolutely. that we've got to be willing to wade through and fair it out some of those things that's, that tripped us up what what forced us to make the decisions choose the people we chose or whatever however you want to look at that um and and man that's an ongoing process for me to this day i you, i don't think you ever stop learning i don't think you ever stop trying to get better understand yourself better make better decisions treat people better uh right on down the line so so that said i mean absolutely 100 percent. that said at this point in your life, coming to where you've come with the UFC, with the movie world, with you, who you are as a person, what do you have any aspirations left? Hopes, goals, dreams? I, I'm I'm having a blast. I feel so blessed to have been down this road and come through the things I've come through. Uh, I I tried to be smart about. You know, I got to be a professional athlete for 14 years. How often do you get to make that kind of money? And so, and I, I traveled through half of that journey before recognizing that. And that light bulb went off the first time I walked down the studio walk at, at MGM Grand. And, and I'm going to the to the weigh-ins, uh, fighting Pedro Hizzo. The first time I fought Pedro Hizzo, this was right after Zufa bought the company. And this was the first fight with them, my first time fighting in Vegas seeing my name on the strip and all of that stuff was crazy. And I'm walking down the studio walk to the arena to, to do the precursor physicals and everything that you have to do before the weigh-ins. And I walk by this store called Juicy Couture. And it, it, just seeing my name in lights on this store, these light bulbs just started going off. And I'm like, what am I thinking? I'm, look what I'm doing. I'm building a brand. I, I could I could do clothes. I could do all, you know. I recognized I wasn't going to be able to fight forever. At some point, there was a statute of limitations physically on how long I could do this. Sure. So I better not be frivolous. I better start learning how to take care of that. And, and that was a, a process. You know, I was in Oregon coaching, making coaching money, which wasn't great but it was a state job. It had great benefits. And now I made all this money in my first two UFC shows. Um, and I got hammered by uncle Sam. The taxes were ridiculous. I'm like, Oh my God, what am I doing here? And so I started learning. I started finding and asking questions, to other businessmen, other people that I knew and formed an LLC, started writing off a bunch of stuff, find the right tax guys, start, start treating this, you know, and slowly started, treating it the way I should be treating it as an athlete that's making this kind of money. And I'm glad I was in my thirties when all this happened. I can't imagine if I was in my early twenties and somebody handed me a check like that. Holy hell. There's a lot of cautionary a whole different story. You know, and, and you know, you probably be maybe, you know, I would have been one of those crazy guys like 
like boss and and some of the others doing some of that crazy stuff if i was younger i think but if i'd been through two divorces already i'd been through some pitfalls and some issues and so i was pretty grounded and knew who i was what i wanted to achieve what i wanted to accomplish and nothing was going to distract me from that and so i kept it simple and stayed right in my lane and, and just tried to get the most out of this body out of this guy and the experience that i had how are you holding up physically no no problems I'm doing very, very well. You know, obviously the discs in my neck are all but worn out from years of wrestling and then years of fighting. And that ultimately, I started in 99 having some atrophy and some tingling and all that stuff. You know, Boss can tell you about his and, and oh, yeah. similar C4, C5 down to T1. Those discs are just tired of my crap. They're worn out. Getting some natural uh, stenosis and, and natural fusion. Got a couple bone spurs in there. And it was only a matter of time it kept the, where I kept grinding out camps and trying to compete at the level I was competing at that I was going to injure myself and probably have to have a surgery and a fusion. And every single guy I know that has had that has no range of motion now, and they're still in pain. They're not any better off. So never comes out. I wanted to try and avoid that at all costs, and that ultimately led me to the year-long decision uh, that it took me to come to terms with walking away from the sport in 2011. Uh, I didn't want to sustain that injury and have to have that fusion and then have the quality of the rest of my life be affected because of that injury or because of that situation in the neck. Um, Man, they should be bringing you around to professional sports teams and young athletes to just uh, give them some education. Jeez, I, it's rare you come across somebody who really has a presence of mind to think into the future like that. That's well, and I think part of that was my age. Part of that was the life I'd already been living. I'd, I'd been in the Army and worn that uniform for six years, traveled around the world on the national team, saw lots of other cultures, lots of other places that were a whole lot more messed up than anything I've ever seen in this country. Oh, yeah. Nobody in this country knows what real oppression is, or very few know what real oppression is. We're on our way there now, though, aren't we? It's going to be very interesting. So okay, start uh, on, we boy. need to start mandating uh, Peace Corps or, or military service like some other countries do. And because most of these 17, 18 year old kids can't find their butt with both hands. They've never seen another culture. They don't recognize just how good we have it in this no, country. I could not so, agree with you more. But boys, going, I was going and experiencing other cultures and seeing what yes. Africa's like, what Cuba's like, what so many other places in, in, in spots in Europe and Eastern Europe certainly are like. Uh, and then coming home and just enjoying that toilet paper. And <laughs> and all the other stuff that we take for granted. <laughs> yeah, we, we did a pro wrestling tour once in the Democratic Republic of Congo, if you can imagine. Oh. And it's like you you've probably been. And yeah, Pat, you're you're preaching to the choir. Subject for story for another day, though. But yeah, it's uh, we'd all be better off if we appreciated what we had and have both. Yeah. So, Randy, what's what? It's been a fast hour. Thank you, man. I I, I want to ask you before. I let you go. I know you're enjoying your time at the ranch. Um, what's next? What what's 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 exciting in life now? Uh, I'm I'm enjoying the process of acting, trying to get more interesting characters to portray and and immerse myself in. I'm interested. Uh, certainly, I've gotten to play in the unit. I've done a few episodes of Hawaii Five O. It seems like when I get these jobs in the TV scene and doing a TV series where you get to play the same character over and over and over. Uh, I get two or three or four episodes in and then the, the show ends and I haven't been able to sustain that. That's something I'm interested in is television. Uh, it's, a, a, it's like feature film on steroids. You're shooting, you know, one week you're shooting an hour long episode of a show like that. I just got to do uh, um, CSI LA, before, you know, again, last season, I got to do the last two season, uh, season ending episodes before they discontinued the show. And uh, I had a blast doing it. So that's, Something I'm interested in, in getting involved in more is, is a regular character series like that. Um, but I'm having a blast. I mean, obviously, The Expendables was a huge step up for me. Acting and getting to rub elbows with so many of those guys that have well, been in the acting well, genre. What was that like, Ben? Honestly, and again, this only meant in a complimentary way. I was blown away when the cast was first announced. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you've got like Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Randy Couture. I'm like, whoa. Um, <laughs> you weren't the only one. You weren't the only one that was going. Whoa! What am how, I here? Yeah, am I how, really here. How did you react to that? I I was I felt I was flattered and honored. You know, I got a call from my agent 
um, you know, I had taken a big step up with, with Scorpion King 2, big universal project connected to the mummy. The rock played the first Scorpion King. So now they were going to do the prequel. They asked me to come in and, and play the main bad guy for, for the prequel in Scorpion King 2. Uh, that was a number one selling DVD that summer for Universal and, and was a huge step up for me in the acting world. I think ultimately that led Sly to seeing me you know, work and, and he's a huge fight fan. And so I got a call from my agent and said, hey, Sylvester Stallone wants you to come by his office. He wants to talk to you about this project. And so I'm like, oh wow, okay, right. That's that's a meeting you're not passing up. So uh, you know, I was I was over there on time, you know, actually ten minutes early because in the army, if you if you're not ten minutes early, you're already late. Right. <laughs> uh, and 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 then the casting director was really funny because the casting director was supposed to show up there too. They she had never met me, and this was Sly's idea to bring another fighter, me, into this movie with all these amazing action stars and. And so he's sitting me down and he had written, he'd written the script and it was originally talking about Hail Caesar as the character that he wanted to adapt from the written script already. For me, he had written that role for Wesley Snipes and Wesley was having some issues. Awesome. And so he was going to revamp that role uh, to fit me. He wanted me to quote Nietzsche and talk about my cauliflower ears and be this college educated wrestler that, that had went into the special forces and became a mercenary. And he kind of had, we had this conversation at casting director was 10 minutes late. So him and I are on the couch just talking about all this stuff that he sees. And the casting director's freaking out because she's late with it for a meeting with Stallone. She comes charging in the room, bumps his bookcase. And he had all these action figures stacked in this bookcase from all the different movies that he'd been in. And oh, one of them was Cobra. Oh, oh, Libretti. 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 Wilson, his, his ex-wife at this time, right? Oh. So when she bumps that bookcase. Brigitte Nielsen falls from the top level all the way down to the floor. So I was like, Jesus, I could have used you a few years ago. Where were you? And we bust out laughing <laughs> because it was his ex-wife's action figure that had fallen on the floor. Right. That's that broke cool. the ice. Um, uh, and we had this amazing conversation about this ensemble cast that he was bringing together and how he saw me fitting in and all of that. Well, a week later, I get get a call from my agent saying hey you know he, he picked up terry cruz to play hail caesar i'm like oh man all right well that you know that makes sense terry's an amazing guy and he's perfect for that role he's great comedic relief for all the action and all the other stuff that's in the script yep. and uh but he wrote you into the movie he created the character toll road based on your conversation and wrote you into the movie so you're still in the movie i'm like what right. wow okay Amazing. Well, obviously, I was flattered and honored that that he thought enough of me as a fighter and a person after that conversation that he, he went to writing as he does. He's an amazing writer, a very smart yeah. man, oh, yeah. and and uh, he wrote me into the film and kept me on. So, total well, now, sequels later, you're like you're you're the core now. You're you yeah. And a, you and a few uh, other. We just, we just had four. We shot four in in 2021 and 2022, and it just hit the theaters a couple of months back in September. Um, obviously the strike was going on. So none of us actors were able to really promote the film, right. but the media received it very, very well. The 15 premieres they did that were all attended by the media were over 90% attended every single one of them. So I think it's done fairly well in the theaters. I haven't heard any official numbers, but I got more screen time and more lines in, in you know, Expendables 4 than I've gotten in any of the other ones. So I I'm, I'm feel like I'm headed in the right direction. Every time I put myself out there, I learn some new tools and new skills in, in, in the process of, of being an actor. And uh, it's been fun. It's been really interesting. It's certainly a lot easier than getting punched in the face. I, no <laughs> kidding. Even, even, when, even when you got your version of Randy Couture punching Jet Li, right? It's a lot <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Come did, a long did, way since then. Did Jet Li remember that all those years later? Oh, he did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Yeah, he remembered that. We talked about that on Expendables 1 because he was on Expendables 1 yeah. and we laughed about it. And then in Spend Expendables uh, 3, uh, Terry, the, the same, uh, he was the second unit director, which is basically a, a director that does all the stunts and all the fight scenes and stuff. Well, he was also our second unit director, the same, when I ran Jed over, 
same guy. Uh, same guy that freaked out. I just ran over the start of the movie, uh, and we met him. I, I reconnected with him on three, Expendables three, and we were laughing about that. I hadn't seen him since then, and that was what 2012 or 2013. So it's been over, well over ten years yeah, since I've been in a different from place there. that second time around. Too amazing, man. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's, it's great talking with you. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. And My uh, pleasure. I, I learned a lot. Uh, people out there, you want to send a message to anybody that the people we talked about that might be having a hard time, just a quick departure. What do you tell people if they need a quick, uh, a quick boost or a, a reset to pull themselves up? I think you have to recognize that you're not alone and that there are people that really genuinely care about you, that, that want you to be happy. They want you to be successful and find those people find a counselor. If, if, if you can't find one of those people to share with and, and open up to and be vulnerable with and, and let those demons out, those demons hate the light of day. And, and if you let those demons out in the right circumstance with the, with the person you're safe with, you can put frames around those and come up with new tools and new ways to deal with those demons and, and put them in proper perspective and then go about chasing that passion that you have and whatever that is. Uh, with everything that you have put the demons to side let them out you know they don't like the light of day this is what mvp is all about merging vets and players so many of these vets come home they can't wait to get out of the service and get out of that uniform and then they don't forward think and recognize that was a huge piece of their identity a huge piece of who they were when they walked away from that uniform and the same thing is true of us as athletes i, I sat next to tony gonzalez in one of our MVP meetings, one of our huddles. And he's like, man, two years ago, I was Superman. I was absolutely the best player on the field. Now who the hell am I? And when somebody that successful and somebody like Tony can be vulnerable and say that in, in a group of vets and athletes that, that are struggling with that same transition, that's amazingly powerful. And yeah, I was so fortunate, both my transitions from that military uniform and from those board shorts that I fought in, I had already had that built-in purpose. I knew where I was going. I, I readjusted my sights on pursuing those things. And that competitive spirit that I have was filled up by chasing those acting jobs or going to college and wrestling at Oklahoma State when I left the Army and drove from Fort Campbell, Kentucky to Stillwater, Oklahoma. Those purposes were already there. We have to have that purpose. That's how we're driven. That's what makes us go. And that's where we flounder because we're our own worst enemies and we get on our own heads and we start our subconscious voice starts talking shit and we have to recognize we control that voice that voice does not control us and i wish i'd have learned this a lot sooner than just through athletics and that how it applied to my everyday life i could have maybe avoided a couple of those divorces but i've been willing to dig into that swamp develop some new tools learn to communicate better be honest and open about what i need and listen to what that person needs from me. There's where we go wrong. We as men are horrible communicators and, and we have to learn that this doesn't control us. In fact, step behind that voice anytime you want. And there's a great book, The Untethered Soul by Michael Sanger. It's one of my favorite books. My sister who struggles with this stuff, you know, uh, she recommended that book to me and that book changed my perception a lot. It brought those psychological and mental skills that I developed for walking out on that mat or up in that cage home to everyday life, to anything that you struggle with and applying that, those same skills and recognizing that you control that voice. You give it those affirmations, those positive things, even if you have to pray and go to church to find those affirmations and those things that keep you on track and keep you doing the right thing, then that's what you do. But you have to recognize that you control that voice first. It does not control you. And you give it those affirmations. I had to write those down on cards and read them when that voice started chattering, when the pressure get turned up and I'm walk, walking into fight week and have to make weight and all that stuff. That's when you get undermined. That's when the confidence, you know, the subconscious voice starts chattering. Oh, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if you do this? What if you do that? And if you buy into that, you're going to be out in the parking lot running sprints. What if I get tired? You know, and now you're going to wonder why you don't have your legs under you on fight night on Saturday night. Because you let that voice undermine your confidence in your plan. So recognizing that you control that voice, it does not control you, is a huge thing. And every time I step behind that voice, I feel loved. God is in each and every one of our chests. He's behind those ribs. 
And he's behind that subconscious voice. That's the world talking. That's not your soul. That's not your spirit. And the more time I spend back there meditating or visualizing success and using those affirmations, the closer I am to God, the more love I feel and the more love I give. Randy, well, wow, that's, I love all that. Thank you. And it's like, and it's such real world advice too. You didn't, you didn't advise people to go stuff, to go do stuff that's not obtainable. They're right in front of everybody and it's available for everybody. So thank you, man. My pleasure. And I think uh, that's probably a really powerful place uh, to leave. I look forward to seeing you headlining with Tony Robbins next year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's your next calling. Who knows? Right? Well, I, I'm just doing my best to keep it simple and 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 continue to chase the passions that I have with everything that I've got. That's a great prescription for life, man. It's super blessed to have you on today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, continued success and happiness to you, my friend. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate you, brother. Be well. Randy, you too. We'll catch you soon. Thank you. Okay. And wrapping up here for Talking Tough, that is Randy Couture, The Natural. You heard about his book. Um, he wrote it uh, in a very transitional part of his journey, I think. It, a really smart time to write that, it sounds like. I read it when it first came out. I think it was about 2006, he mentioned. I'm going to pick it up and read it again. And I'm also going to take Randy's advice and check out The Untethered Soul. You can follow Randy on Instagram to search Randy Couture. Uh, great stuff. And if you're watching today on Hannibal, Hannibal himself told me to remind you all of this. If you're watching on Hannibal, please check out my YouTube also. That's uh, Rick Bassman, youtube.com forward slash Rick Bassman. Signing off on another episode for Talking Tough. Thank you all.